<laughs> My name's uh, Jesse Morell, and uh, you know, I'm a campus preacher, open-air preacher. I got saved back in uh, 2000, and uh, I was a wicked, wicked sinner. Uh, I didn't know God. I uh, was idolatrous. I would party every day. Uh, we were you know, very carnal people, very sinful people. I remember one time uh, at a party, and you know, at my uh, apartment, everyone used to come to my house after school. It was right through the woods, so we just walked through the woods and come to my apartment. My mother wasn't home till you know six, six thirty at night, so we could party all afternoon when we we're out of school and just clean up the house before she gets there. And, and uh, was videotaping the, the party, everything that was going on, all the wickedness, all the, the drinking and pot smoking. And I remember I turned to the camera and I, I said, I worship the god of marijuana. Wow! And Man! You know, Weird. You know, it was, a, it was a confession. It surprised myself at the time. <laughs> but, you know, really, whatever you worship is whatever you devote yourself to, whatever you think the most about, whatever you give yourself over to. Yeah. And to me, it was drugs and alcohol. Ultimately, I was my own God trying to please myself. There you go. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, Brother James was talking about, you know, we need prison ministries and we need uh, elderly home ministries and we need all of that. And uh, I got saved through someone's prison ministry. Right. And I was locked up. Right. And uh, I had never had anyone in my whole life ever tell me that I was in trouble with God for my sin and on my way to hell. I never had anyone ever confront me for my wickedness. I had people in my high school come up to me and tell me, you know, oh God, uh, He loves you, He cares about you, He wants to have a relationship with you. And I thought, well, that, that sounds nice. Uh, I, you know, as far as I was concerned, I... I knew God. I went to church, you know, a couple times a year, and you know, I I didn't know what they were really trying to say. It wasn't until I was locked up and I heard a preacher, a loud preacher, who told us because of our sin we were deserving of hell and on our way to hell and unfit for heaven. And that's when I got shot with the arrow of conviction in my heart, and my eyes were opened, my conscience was quickened, and I knew I was in trouble with God. It was, it was like a lightning flash. Suddenly I realized the danger I was in. Saw something I never saw before. And I tried, I remember looking in the mirror and, you know, getting high and getting drunk and trying to shake this conviction wow. that I was in trouble with God. And I couldn't do it. I couldn't, couldn't shake the conviction. There in year 2000, I yielded my life to Christ and uh, committed myself to Him and yeah. Been changed and transformed, never been the same since. Yeah. Lord, amen. So I'm preaching out on the streets, and uh, you know, praise God. We've seen a lot of people come to the Lord. Drug dealers have repented. Satanists have repented. Homosexuals have repented. Glory to God. Yeah, amen. Come on. Praise right. the Lord. It doesn't happen overnight. Right. Uh, it takes a lot of work, a lot of labor, a lot of time. It's always very few, never the majority. Right. And a lot of people get saved that we never even hear about. Right. Because who wants to repent in front of a God-mocking crowd? Yeah. In front of a hostile environment like that, a lot of them will go home with the conviction in their heart. That's and right. Seek God and get right with God. So I appreciate uh, all of you men and what you do. And uh, all the campus preachers, all the street preachers, the event preachers, we need them all. And right. We don't have enough. And thank God we're a growing movement. Yeah. You know, we're, we're, we're multiplying. Thank you, Jesus. We're having an impact, raising up more and more laborers. Right. We need more and more. Yeah. So I'm going to talk to you tonight about man's fallen condition and unregenerate state of mind. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Romans chapter 8, verse 7 and 8. says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subjected to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So they that are in the flesh cannot please God. 
right. So let's pray, Jesus. Father. Thank you for your word, for your truth. Yes, Lord. Pray that you will minister to us tonight, Lord. Edify us, move by your yes. Holy Spirit, Lord. Mm -hmm. As I yield myself to you to be a vessel in your hands. Lord, speak through me, Father. By your Spirit, give me the words to speak. Yes. Many times I don't know what to say, Lord. I'm just so dependent on you, Lord. Yes. Need your help, need your spirit, need right. your grace, yes. Lord. Yes. Enlighten my mind, to yes. open up my eyes, Lord, that I can yes. preach your truth with yes. anointing and affection. Yes. Yes. Lord, I pray that you'll have your way tonight in this meeting, and we will be edified and you will be glorified. Yes. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So here... Apostle Paul talks about the carnal mind. And I preach out there on campus, and I uh, rebuke them for being carnally minded. And I asked the student, I said, do you know what it means to be carnally minded? A lot of students have no idea. So I have to explain it to them. One student said, yes, yes I do. Well, what does it mean? He says, it means to be focused on the flesh. Well, that's very good. You know, very rare do I find, uh, you know, intelligence on universities and colleges. <laughs> yeah. Right. Stunned, yeah. Yeah, I was taken back. I tell them, you know, this is supposed to be a place of higher education, but many of you just get high. Yeah. You don't get the education part. Yeah. Right. And I've noticed, uh, uh, you know, over the years it's gotten worse. Uh, they're, they're not getting any smarter. Uh, they're getting dumber. Right. right. Uh, they used to be able to ask, you know, uh, me tough questions and uh, pause and have to think about it. You know, now that they, they aren't even asking good questions anymore. They're not uh, taught right. critical right. thinking. Amen. Right. So I asked this sinner, what does it mean to be carnally minded? And he knew it means to be focused on the flesh. And if you do go to the Greek, to be carnally minded is to be purposed on your flesh, to live a carnal life. It's a purpose of the mind. You see, the will is a faculty of the mind. When people talk about, you know, I've made up my mind to do this. Or I changed my mind about doing that. And those are expressions we use expressing that it's with our mind that we have a purpose, an intention. Uh, the will is a faculty of the mind. And to be carnally minded is... Uh, you know, living for your passions and your impulses and your appetites, uh, living for your carnal nature, essentially uh, living like animals. Right. You know, right. and I'm out there on the campus and I'm preaching to them how you guys, you're not living by your conscience, you're not living by your intelligence, you're living by your feelings, living by your appetites, whatever feels good, do it. And so you get drunk, and you get high, and you get laid, not because your conscience tells you it's good, but because it feels good. Right. 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 And uh, showing how carnal they are. Well, before I even got to my point to rebuke them that they're living like animals, one of the students said, we're just living like a bunch of animals, aren't we? Right. Yeah. He knew it himself. Right. In fact, they're worse than animals. Amen. Worse than brutes. That's right. Because the animals don't have a conscience. Right. And an animal is living by his nature. Right. We were not meant to live that way. We were not designed to live that way. It's unnatural. And we know it to be wrong. And so, a sinner who is carnally minded is living worse than an animal. Amen. Now, to be carnally minded, it's a voluntary state of mind. Right. Now, all, uh, all moral philosophy, or all, all theology assumes some type of moral philosophy. Uh, you can't escape moral philosophy if you're going to study the Bible. Every right. uh, mention of sin, any type of definition of sin is a moral philosophy. The Gnostics had their own moral philosophy that, you know, the material universe, uh, the physical was evil, and the flesh is a sin. Therefore, they denied Jesus came in the flesh. Uh, that was their moral philosophy uh, based on their view of sin. Well, here I would contend that the carnal mind is the essence of sin. That's my moral philosophy, uh, and I assume it to be the uh, moral philosophy of the Bible. 
that sin at its essence is this carnal mind of living for your own selfish pleasure and your own self-gratification for the indulgence of your own appetites. Right. That that is your primary pursuit in life. Right. And that's sin. Right. You know, in theology, they, they call it your ultimate intention. Right. And your ultimate intention is whatever your, your primary, your supreme objective for being is. Why? Are you living? Why are you doing what you're doing? What are you in ultimate pursuit of? And for the Christian, it's the glory of God. Sure. And, for, and that's our primary. That's the greatest commandment. And the second is the well-being of our neighbor. But for the sinner, it's for himself. Mm -hmm. And everything he does is for himself. Mm -hmm. And the reason he commits acts of sin is because he has this heart of sin. This carnal mind. And every act of sin is, some, is nothing more than a manifestation of this mindset. Right. Of this purpose of heart. A purpose of mind. Now, the advantage of recognizing the essence of sin being this, all, this selfish state of mind. To be carnally minded. Is that when you go out on campus, you go out on the streets. You're... You, you're not limited to simply rebuking a few acts that they might occasionally commit. Mm -hmm. But now you can rebuke their entire life. That's right. Sure. You can rebuke everything that they do. Right. And I can go out on a campus mm -hmm. and I can say, you pot smokers are going to hell, you drunkards are going to hell. Someone comes up to me and says, well, I don't smoke pot and I don't get drunk. Well, okay. Well, why did you come to college? Hmm. Well, Why are you here? Did you ask God, God, what do you want me to do with my life? Good. Did you ask God, God, what university do you want me to go to, if you want me to go to a university at all? Yeah. Come yeah. On. Come on. Mm -hmm. You came to college because you thought it was a good thing to do for you. Yeah. So that you might get an education, you might get a degree, you might get a career, you might make a good income, you might live in a good neighborhood, and you did it all for you. Yeah. Uh, and the motive of your heart is no better than a bank robber or a murderer, or a thief, right. or a rapist, or a child molester, all you've done your whole life is pursued your own self-gratification. And you didn't care about God. Yeah, right. You didn't even consider God, didn't even think about God. Yeah, your entire life is a sin. Amen. Right. Your entire life is enmity with God. Right. And you need to repent of your entire life. The advantage of recognizing sin to be this essence of, you know, the selfishness. Sin is the carnal mind, living for your own self-pleasure, pursuit of pleasure, pursuit of fulfillment of your appetites. It shows that you can rebuke everything that they do. Yeah. Yeah. How do you judge a man's character? You know, Finney would give an example of a guy goes to Bible college. Hmm. Okay, here's two guys, both going to Bible college. You know, and they, uh, they're studying hard. They read their books. They want to pass and, you know, get into the ministry. So you ask them, why did you come to Bible college? They say, well, you know, one guy says, well, you know, I want to go into the ministry. I want to be a preacher. Hmm. Okay, why do you want to be a preacher? Uh -huh. Come on. Hmm. Well, I want, to, I want to minister God's word to the people. Well, why? Why do you want to minister God's word to them? Yeah. And if some of them were honest, it's because, well, they like the respect. They, they like the money. They, they, they like the lifestyle that it brings. The praises of men. And you know, okay, for that man, going to Bible college is a sin. Right. Amen. Bible college itself is a sin to that man. Studying the Bible is a sin to that man. Just like the scribes and the Pharisees who would pray and fast to be seen of men. Right. Right. Now you look at a man, look, this man prays, this man fasts. Oh, he must be a good character. He's not out there with the harlots. He doesn't even talk to them. Oh, he must be a righteous man. Oh, look at his heart. 
you know a man's character by his heart. You know That's a man's a character by his intention. Right. And praying and fasting for that man is a sin. Because he's doing it for himself. He's doing it selfishly. And God is not in any of it. And that's why Jesus would rebuke them more than any other. But then you have another man who goes to Bible college. Well, he, he studies his books. He asks him, why did you come to Bible college? He wants to be a minister. He wants to minister God's word to the people. Well, why do you want to do that? Well, for the glory of God. Because I love God. And I want Him to be glorified. And I don't want sinners to go to hell. I want people to live for God. But they might be happy and God might be happy. And he does it out of love. Well, that's the fulfillment of the law. Now, going to Bible college for him is a virtue. Reading the Bible for him is a virtue. You see, that's my moral philosophy. That uh, virtue and vice do not consist in mere externals, in mere outward actions. Because two people can do the exact same thing externally, and yet for one it's virtuous and for another it's sinful. Right. It's all about the heart. That's the essence of moral character. Amen. And these sinners out there on campus, they don't love God. It's true. And if they do any good towards their neighbor, it's not because they're living by a principle of true benevolence, but ultimately because God is the author of their nature. And we have a, a natural compassion natural sympathy for our fellow man. Hmm. You know, you could have a God-hating, sin-loving sinner walk by and see a suffering homeless man and, and just naturally feel compassion for him. Naturally, it disturbs him to see the suffering of his fellow. So here, let me give you some money. Why does he do that? Not because he loves God and not because he's living by a true principle of benevolence, of living for the well-being of his neighbor. Because he's living by his feelings. And at that time, those were his feelings. Then he walks down the block, and hey, there's some harlots. And now he has a different feeling. That's right. <laughs> and so a man who's sleeping with harlots, acting by mere feeling, is no different than a man giving money to the poor because of his mere feelings. That's right. So any good that a sinner does is not because there's any virtue in him. Right but only because of his God-given nature. Yes. Right. So sinners are living by this carnal mind. Their ultimate intention is selfish and sin. Therefore, everything they do is sinful. Right. That's total depravity. Right. I believe in the total depravity of the sinner. Sure. Sinner has no virtue in him. Sinner has nothing good in him, morally speaking. Right. Sinner is totally depraved. And it's because nothing he does is done with the right motives. Nothing he does is done for the glory of God. Nothing he does is truly good or righteous Amen. or holy. Amen. That was the problem with the Pharisees. Where, and the Israelites, they thought, well, I'm circumcised. I'm a child of Abraham. I go to the synagogue. I do this. I do that. And it's all mere externals. But in their heart, they didn't have true faith in God. They didn't have true love for God. So, uh, a sinner is totally depraved. But it's a voluntary depravity. It's a voluntary state of mind. It's his own fault. That he's choosing to live this way. Now, the... The essence of law respects your will. You know, uh, your, your feelings are not under the direct control of your will. When God commands us to love Him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, love our neighbor as ourselves, uh, love is not a mere feeling and emotion. And that's what these sinners on campus think. And uh, it's been the, you know... The misconception since the 60s. The hippies were saying, you know, make love, not war. Right. And what they really meant was have sex. Right. That's what they meant. Making love was having sex. Love. 
And these students say, I just don't feel the love. Where's the love? Yeah. When you're preaching and rebuking sin. They think love is a feeling. Right. Hmm. Love is not a sensation. Love is not a feeling. Amen. Love's a committal of the will. Yes. And they don't recognize love when it's right before their face. That's right. And so God's law is directives towards our will. And it's the will through which all moral actions uh, arise. Amen. The intention of your heart. You choose what your motive of life is. Sure. If you choose anything at all, that's what you choose. Right. Once that is chosen, everything else falls in place by necessity. Right. If that is wrong, everything else by necessity will be wrong. Right. If you're choosing to live your own selfish, carnal life in pursuit of your own gratification then because of that ultimate intention, you must make choices that are mere means to that end. You're right, exactly. And every act of sin is just a means to that end. Amen. So that's not what the sinner has true liberty over. If he chooses the end, he must by necessity choose the means. Right. There's no liberty there. The liberty is on choosing the end. And the Bible says, set your affections on things above. That's the choice. Right. right. The Bible says, whatsoever is pure or whatsoever is holy, think on these things. That's a choice. Are you going to live for the glory of God or for your own self-gratification? That's the free choice. Right. So it's a voluntary state of mind as the law respects voluntary actions of the will. And uh, the unregenerate state of mind Man's fallen condition. It's not what many theologians think it to be. It's far worse than how they portray it. See, they think, many theologians think, the more they hammer on man's total inability, the greater a sinner he must be. If a man has absolutely no natural ability to do anything good, then he must be a terrible, terrible sinner. Well, I say, what if a man has absolute ability to do what is right and good, and yet he doesn't? Well, Who's the greater sinner? The man who can't or the man who won't? Amen. Good point. Who's the real sinner? Right. Yeah. So teaching the natural ability of man is not, as they think, a more optimistic view of mankind. It's a more pessimistic view. Yeah, come on. When I look at mankind, I see a great deal of potential. We were created with such capacities by our Creator for a life of virtue, a life of righteousness, a life of goodness. And yet, despite all of that potential and capacity, right. our world is so wicked, so depraved, yeah. so evil. So teaching the ability of man does not nullify his depravity, it magnifies yes, it his does. depravity. Right. <laughs> Good. And so, uh, as the Augustinians thought, they thought free will was lost. And, oh, man is a terrible sinner who cannot do anything good. Well, first of all, if you read Genesis, out of all the consequences, God declared, in light of his sin, the loss of his free will was not one of them. There you go. Amen. To work by the sweat of your brow, pain and childbearing, cutting off from the tree of life. Out of all these consequences, the loss of mankind's free will was not mentioned. And immediately after the fall of Adam and his original sin, God dealt with Cain as a free moral agent. He sure did. Right. And tried to reason with Cain. Yeah. yeah. You can do well. Yeah. You have no reason to be upset. Why are you so doubtful? Right. Right. If you do well, will it not be accepted? There sin is. lies at the door, and his desire is to have you, and you must rule over him. Amen. Here, God is dealing with man, even after the original sin of Adam, as a free moral agent, capable of moral choice. Yeah. And he dealt with Israelites the same way. Choose Good. you this day whom you will serve. I set before you life. I set before you death. Therefore, choose life. Come on. 
God wasn't making the choice for him. He was, he was giving them that choice. Yep. Giving them the option between two open alternatives. So the freedom of man's will was not lost. In fact, that's what grace needs to influence. Man's will. Yep. Grace is not mere uh, unmerited favor, as it's often defined, though it is that. Uh, more specifically, if you go to, say, a Greek lexicon like Thayer's, it's the divine influence upon the heart. Right. That's it. Right. That's right. it. Now that's unmerited. If a man is capable of performing his duty, but he is unwilling, then any divine influence to make him willing is an unmerited uh, influence. Right. It's an act of grace. And so the freedom of man's will is what cooperates, or, or what, it goes hand in hand with grace. It was, it's not that free will denies uh, the need and necessity for grace. That's Augustinian theology. They think grace needs to liberate your will from an inability. That's the, that's the function of grace. So if your will's already free, you therefore don't need grace. Ultimately, it's their theology that denies the need of grace if free will is affirmed. Right. Yeah. But if free will is affirmed, man is capable of doing his duty. He has no excuse before God. He is utterly unwilling to do it then any, any influence, any effort that God put, puts forth to change man's will is absolutely unmerited, absolutely gracious. But if, on the other hand, a man cannot perform his duty, he cannot do what God has required, and yet God threatens eternal hell if he fails to do it, then any action that God does to liberate man's will, to make him capable of doing his duty, is no longer an act of grace, but an act of justice. Because it would be unjust for God to require a man at the threat of eternal hell to do that which he cannot do. Right. That's right. So it's only on the basis of man's natural ability created in the image of God that was not lost by the fall of Adam that grace is truly grace. Right. So the ultimate problem is not inability but unwillingness. When I'm out there on these campuses and on the streets... Just like every other street preacher, I assume their natural ability. Right. If you did not, you would not blame them. Right. Why do you treat them like it's their fault? Amen. Why do you talk to them as if they can change? Right. Right. Yeah. Amen. Come on. Because we all it's a it's it's a truth of intuition. That here, you know, we all naturally know we have a power of contrary choice. It's why you feel guilty if you sin. You knew you could have done otherwise. And if you, if you were truly convinced in your heart of hearts you could not have done otherwise, you would feel no guilt at all. Amen. You would feel justified because you would, you would feel excused. Correct. And so we know ourselves to be without excuse for our sin and just our consciousness. It's a, a self-evident truth. It's a first truth we take for granted. It's a, a priori apart from any reasoning at all. Right. Right. And uh, knowing that this sinner out there is our fellow man, he's a moral being just like we are. And therefore he's without excuse. And I rebuke him and call him to repent and blame him because I know he's capable of obeying God, but he's unwilling to do so. That's right. That's right. That's right. And his inability is nothing more than unwillingness. Come on. Right. The only thing that keeps him back from serving God is his carnal mind. Right. His selfish intention of heart. Right. Right. He loves his sin. And, uh, you know, they come up, they, they say, well, you can't repent. You can't turn from sinning. You can't stop sinning. And uh, it's like, you know, one of these people, they've been raised on video games. They play so many video games, and they just can't imagine life without video games. Hmm. People with TV, they watch so much TV, they love TV. And they just can't imagine a household without TV. Right. right. And they'll even say things like, I, I can't live without television. Right. I can't live without my video game. Right. No, it's not that you can't, that you love it so much that you won't. Amen. And the same goes for the sinner. They say, I can't stop sinning. I can't live without sin. Right. It's unthinkable to them, unimaginable. No, it's not that you can't, but that you won't because you love it so much. That's right. Amen. Come on, brother. So it's not God's fault. You know, right. when God gave us this world, this world was good. Amen. He 
gave us authority and dominion over it. And it was good. And it was after he gave it to us, he could no longer say it was good. It was then grieving in his heart. It wasn't God's fault that this world is so messed up. It's our fault. It's man's fault. And I tell the sinners on campus, you know why this world is such an awful place? It's because of you sinners. That's there why. you go. <laughs> That's why. That gets if it wasn't for the sin, this world would be heaven on earth. Yeah, sure. That's right. What do we what do we ask? We say, Thy will be done yeah. on earth as it is in heaven. Yeah. We're asking for heaven on earth, and it would be heaven on earth if only God's will was done. Right. Yeah. right. And the only reason it's not heaven on earth is because they're violating his will. Right. Now, I've been uh, I've been locked up many times as a sinner, even as a believer. And uh, you know, here in America, in the United States, well, these prisons and jails, they're not so bad. <laughs> as facilities. Yeah. These facilities are, you know, funded by the government, yeah. well-kept, sanitary, yeah. you know, a nice metal toilet, and it sparkles in the light, glimmers. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the sheets are washed on a regular basis. They give you clean socks, clean underwear, a clean jumpsuit. You know, uh, they wash their dishes and forks and... It's a sanitary facility. I went to the Dominican Republic and preached in a prison there, and it was filth. Filth. Rusty bars, you know, cracked walls. You don't even know what kind of, you know, filth is on the floor. And they'll just put a hundred guys in one room, one big cell, and, just, and, and it's just filth. It's like, man, you know, Going to prison in the United States is not so bad. Yeah. You know, the worst part about prison or being locked up in the United States is not the facility, it's the company. <laughs> right. Yeah. And if it wasn't for the company, it wouldn't be so bad. How about that? Yeah. It's, it's heated or air conditioned, three meals a day. Television. Sometimes television. I have a cousin in prison right now, and he, he was Facebooking me somehow. Huh. Wow. wow. It's like a hotel. Wow. <laughs> oh, yeah. Man. I remember a friend sent me, uh, sent my family some letters from prison and had some photos taken. You know, we hadn't seen him for a while. So, oh, I just got these done at the prison, uh, you know, uh, photo photography <laughs> department. Man. <laughs> yeah. It's at a state prison. It's more like a resort. Yeah. Yeah, but... When I, back when I was getting locked up as a sinner, they still had the gym. You could work out. I think they've done away with that now because the you know, guards were not keeping up with their size. So if it wasn't for the company, it wouldn't be that bad of a place. You know, I don't mind solitude. Be locked up. I let you read your Bible. Yeah. If it wasn't for all the low lives. Right. If it wasn't for the bad character and the corrupt people. And the depravity of their mind. Even as a sinner, I saw it was filth. I knew naturally this is, you know, it's not, it's not the, it's not the degradation of the facility. It's the depravity of the people. And the same applies to this world. This world's quite nice. You know, uh, blue sky, green grass, green trees, and in the fall, the trees, you know, they change color. Oh, and you got. Rivers and oceans and beaches. Man, this, this facility is quite nice. Yep. And it would be a paradise, a heaven on earth, if it wasn't for all the people. Right. If it wasn't for all the sinners. There you go. Right. That's the problem. That's the problem. And it's not God's fault. Right. God made us in His image. Amen. Created us capable of virtue. And it's not the problem of the nature that He gave us. You know, um... People talk about the depravity of man's nature. You know, man uh, created and designed by God, you could say we've been engineered. Right. In fact, it's self-evident that we've been engineered. That's for <laughs> sure. You consider man's uh, digestive system, reproductive system, uh, there, every, every, every aspect of man's being, we're, we're engineered. One of the most complicated, uh, complex systems in the entire universe. Body of mankind. Body of a man. 
And then you have the ecosystem. We see this world was designed. You have the uh, solar system. Right. If you put it in a syllogism, you can see that, uh, you know, a system indicates order. And uh, order indicates mind. Right. And there's order throughout the entire universe. Therefore, the universe indicates mind. Mind. The mind right. of God. And as uh, there's order throughout the entire universe, and that order indicates mind, you should know that there's a mind greater than the entire universe. That's God. The same applies to man's nature. We've been engineered and designed. And uh, it's not our design to sin. It's a violation of our design. I remember the first time I took a rip off the bog and tried to hold it in, and I just couldn't. I had to cough it out. So my lungs were not designed for smoke. They were designed for oxygen. Right. You know, an alcoholic, a drunkard who drinks and drinks and drinks, kills his liver. Right. And hurts his kidneys. Because the body was not designed for the consumption of alcohol. Right. That's why you get a hangover. That's why you'll vomit. Or the first time I got drunk, vomited all over the place. That's right wasn't my design. I was violating my design. That's right. And as I persevered in my sin, I corrupted my constitution. Now I, I became accustomed to it, even started to crave it. Right. I perverted myself. Right. Smoking cigarettes gave me a headache, made me cough. I didn't like the smell. As I persevered, didn't notice the smell, and now my body started to crave it. Yeah. I corrupted it. I did it. I perverted it. Right. A man's nature, you can say, is, has a higher nature and a lower nature. Your higher nature would be your intellect, your conscience. You know, uh, it's an expression. People say, let me appeal to your higher nature. They're talking about, you know, your moral principle. Your conscience. Your conscience. That's your higher nature. Yeah. Then you have your lower nature of mere appetite. You know, sensation, sensibilities. And a sinner is not living for his higher nature. He's living for his lower nature. Amen. Now, God gave us our lower nature. In and of itself, it's not bad. Like Augustinians have thought, uh, sexual desire was, a, was in and of itself a sin. Right. That in the beginning, sexual desire had no part in God's creation. You know, so that's why his opponent, Augustine's opponent, Julian the Pelagian, uh, criticizing Augustine in that point, so, well, when God said, be fruitful and multiply, that was before the original sin of Adam. Right. What was he expecting them to do? To shake the babies out of the trees? Yeah. 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 Right. Exactly. No. No, God, God gave us sexual desire. It's ordained by God. But we are never to be controlled by it. We were in, supposed to be in control of it. Yeah. Right. And use it the way God had intended. And sin is taking a natural desire and seeking to gratify it through an unnatural means. Yeah. Like sodomy, or bestiality, or adultery and fornication. Incest. Incest. Unnatural means of gratifying a natural desire. Amen. So it's not that man's nature in and of itself is a sin. It's not that sexual desire in and of itself is the involuntary impulse or passion itself is a sin, but how you choose to use it, yeah. how you choose to gratify it, is the sin. Right. So a sinner is out of balance. Right. He is flipped upside down. Mm -hmm. That he's, He has established his lower nature as supreme. Yes. And his higher nature, which was meant to regulate and to control his lower nature, is now simply being abused and misused so he can invent new ways of doing evil. He can invent with his mind that was supposed to be for the service of God and for the service of virtue. He now uses his mind for the service of sin. Right. For the gratification of himself. Self, yeah, yeah. Instead of, as the Bible says, to love God with all of your mind, he's not thinking with his mind, how can I love God? He's thinking with his mind, how can I get, you know, porno on my iPhone? Right. Uh, gratify his lower nature. He's out of whack, out of balance. It's not that that's his design. It's not that that's his nature. That he's perverting his nature. He's corrupted his nature. Right. He's living contrary right. to his nature. Right. It's unnatural for a man to live like a brute beast of the woods. 
It's unnatural for a man to live for his lower appetites and passions. It's unnatural for a man to violate his conscience. And your conscience is the supreme faculty of your nature. And that's self-evident. It automatically claims supreme authority. Right. It regulates everything that you do. It claims yeah. authority over every impulse right. that you have. Amen. It has a natural authority. You naturally know it to be the supreme faculty of your nature. And as it's a violation of your conscience to sin, and your conscience is the supreme faculty of your nature, it is therefore a violation of your nature to sin. Amen. That's why the Bible says the Gentiles which have yep. not the law do by nature the things contained in the law. Right. Showing the work of the law written on their hearts, their conscience bearing witness. Amen. And the problem is not that God gave man a sinful nature, since God is the one who forms us in the womb. And David said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are the works of your hands. It's not that our constitution that God gave us is a sin or is sinful, but that you can pervert it, corrupt it, misuse it, and thereby uh, pursue sin through it. You can develop a sinful nature by your own choice. In fact, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3, were by nature children of wrath, even as the others. One of the common Augustinian proof texts that you're born with a sinful nature if you are by nature children of wrath. Well, the whole, the whole context is a sinful lifestyle of pursuing your, your own pleasure, right. living for your appetites and your passions and desires. Yeah. And the, the Greek word, uh, if you go to like a Greek lexicon like Thayer's, it can mean a mode of feeling and acting which by long habit has become nature. Amen. See, you know, you can, you know, it became, you know, like nature for me to, uh, to live a certain way. You know, always getting drunk, always getting high. That just became, it was like nature. Yeah. The Bible says, uh, how can an Ethiopian uh, change his skin or a leopard his spots? How can you, that are accustomed to do evil, do what is good? Right. See, it's talking about in a, a, you're accustomed to it. So that's an analogy. An Ethiopian and his skin, that's nature. Uh, a leopard and his spots, that's nature. Hmm. Being accustomed to doing evil is habit. So habit can become so strong it becomes like nature. Yeah, right. And it's comparable to your nature. Yeah. We call it your second nature. Yes. You know, you become such a good athlete that, you know, sh shooting hoops. It's like nat it's like your nature. Yeah. You know, or a painter, an artist, to become they do it so much it's like nature. Campus preaching has become like nature to me. I, you know, I used to be nervous. It was very unnatural, abnormal, you know, now I go out there, it's natural, it's normal, I do it all the time. Right. The same applies to the sinner. He just sins all the time and through his habitual habits, he's given himself a sinful nature. It becomes like nature for him to lie, like nature for him to steal. Right. When he started, it was against his nature. He felt guilty. That's right. Had a violation of his conscience. conscience. He developed a sinful nature by his own choice. So it's not God's fault. It's absolutely man's fault. God tried to prevent the sin of this world. Tried to reason with Adam. In the day that you eat, you will surely die. Why would he give him that motivation and that incentive? Unless he was trying to avoid it. Right. right. Obviously, he's trying to deter him. Trying to reason with him as a moral being. God did the same with Cain and with Israel all throughout. So God... It's not his fault. He is grieved by it. He is angered by it. Right. He repented of making the world because of sin. Right. You know, back to this issue of your nature, it's, it's not a sin to have flesh. No. That's what people think. Calvinists tell me this all the time. Yeah. Well, I'm flesh. I'm, I'm just flesh. I was born of flesh. I'm always, until I get a glorified body, I, I just, I'm flesh. This is a sin. And they'll point to their flesh. This, this is a sin. Oh, yeah. Time and time and time again. Gnosticism is alive and well today. Amen. They just don't call it Gnosticism anymore. Yeah. No, having flesh is not a sin. God gave me this flesh. But living for your flesh is a sin. Amen. This was never meant to be my God. The Bible talks about those whose God is their belly. Mm -hmm. Your belly was given to you by God. Right. But your belly was not meant to be your God. Yes. It's unnatural for your belly to be your God. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
It's a violation of the natural order of things. And so, to, when the Bible speaks of flesh in a negative way, it's talking about living after the flesh. My flesh is holy. You know, they were... Uh, candlesticks in the temple of God that were considered holy. Well, how can, how can candlesticks be holy? They're not moral agents. They're not personalities. They're not conscious beings. Well, because they were consecrated to the service of God. That's right. Even physical, inanimate, amoral objects can be called holy. Right. The Bible says, yield your members yes. as instruments of righteousness. Yes. Right. As you yielded your members as instruments of unrighteousness. This right. flesh that God gave me, I used to sin. That's right. I have the scars to prove it. This flesh that God gave me, I used as an instrument of unrighteousness right. to pursue my own gratification and selfish purpose of yeah, life. Right. But now as a Christian, that purpose of life has been changed. Now my flesh is holy. Amen. Amen. Presented my body a living sacrifice. Holy. Amen. Acceptable unto God. Amen. So it is that this flesh is holy. It's sanctified. It's not glorified, but it is sanctified. Yes. Right. So they, you live for the flesh. It's a sin. So uh, let's see how much time do I have here? Just a little bit. Now, this carnal mind is absolutely unreasonable. If you consider consider the natural order of things, you know God is supreme naturally. And uh, our fellow man is our equal, naturally. It's just the natural order of things. We were created equal. For me to regard myself as supreme is to be contrary to the natural order of things. For me to be carnally minded where my supreme purpose of life is my own self-gratification, my own selfish you know, happiness, it's to violate the natural relationships that I have uh, towards my fellow man and towards God. I ought to regard God as supreme because He is. And I ought to regard my neighbor as my equal because He is. So God's law is in accordance with the natural order of things. To love Him supremely, love my neighbor equally, that's just the law reaffirming what, what, what nature itself would tell us. Amen. And so for me to live selfish is to be absolutely unreasonable. For me to regard God as supreme is intelligent. Amen. Because He is. Amen. For me to treat my neighbor as my equal, as my fellow, that's reasonable. Because that's what He is. Right. And if everyone, think about that system. If you were to create a moral system, with, if you were to give a moral law, I mean, you, there's only really... Morally speaking, two options, selfishness or love. That's it. Right. And if everyone lives carnally minded, if everyone lives selfish, what's going to be the result? Not the highest happiness of all, the highest misery of all. If everyone is out for me, 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 ultimately, you know, the sinner's not going to be happy because he's going to have that still small voice of conscience. And that's why they get so angry at us out on campus, because they know they're wrong. Right. And they don't want to be reminded. Right. They know in their heart they're wrong. Yeah. That's why they get so angry, start foaming and frothing at the mouth, right. and try and shut you down. Right. Because you're reminding them of what they already know and what they yes. choose not to know, what they want to be ignorant of, and yet they cannot be. And no matter how much they pursue their sin, they still know in their heart of hearts they're wrong. Yeah. So a sinner can never truly be happy in his sin. That's why he's always pursuing more and more sin. Right. And worse and worse sins. Right. He never has peace of mind. He always has self-condemnation. He doesn't have self-respect. And of course the one who's being sinned against is not going to be happy. They're the ones being violated. Right. And so if everyone is living a self-centered life, you're, you're going to have the highest misery of all, the highest possible misery that there could ever be. Nothing tends towards misery more than selfishness. Right. You cannot have a higher misery than everyone living a selfish life. But if everyone lives a life of love in accordance to God's law, you're going to have the highest happiness of all, the highest well-being of all.
well-being of our neighbor, for their good, and for their happiness as we ought to, and for God, for His glory and His happiness to please Him, and we'll have universal happiness. Heaven will be a place of happiness because heaven will be a place of holiness. Amen. And it's going to be void of all sin. And I tell the sinners on campus, you know why everyone's going to be happy in heaven? Because you're not going to be there. That's why. Because God's not going to let you sinners into heaven to ruin the place. Amen. And if you were allowed into heaven, it'd be no better than earth. It would be no better than what we're having right now. He must exclude you from heaven. That's why we're going to be happy there. Everyone's going to be a loving person. Loving God supremely, loving their neighbor equally. And I tell the sinner, if God were to let you into heaven, you wouldn't be happy anyways. That's right. Because you don't love God. You know what we're going to do for eternity? We're going to love God. And you don't want to praise God, but you know what we're going to do forever? We're going to praise God. And if you were around that, all these people loving God, all these people what? praising God, you would be miserable. Yeah, that's right. Right. That's right. You wouldn't be happy there. Heaven wouldn't be heaven for you. Right. That's right. Unless you change your heart. Yep. Amen. Unless you change your mind. Glory to God. Yep. And then, of course, in hell you're not going to be happy. You're going to be weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. Right. So you, sinner, when you die, you'll never be happy again. Right. You're not going to be happy in hell, and you could not be happy in heaven. That's right. Amen. You better change your heart today. It's good, brother. Amen. So love tends towards happiness. You know, that's the purpose of uh, government, to promote the rights of the people. We need to remember that, especially with the way our government is going. The government does not, you know, the people do not exist for the government. The government exists for the people. And laws are meant and designed to be for the well-being of the people. And that's the natural tendency of, say, the Ten Commandments are uh, you know, horizontal and vertical relationships. A law, God's moral law, is relational. Now that got, you call it moral government. Uh, some people don't like the term moral government. Moral government is not a theology. Uh, moral government is a paradigm. Right. It is a framework through which you understand the ways of God. Amen. That God has a moral government is not denied by any biblical theologian. That God has a moral government is not denied by any Bible-believing Christian. If you believe in the existence of sin, then you believe in the existence of moral government. Right. Because sin is nothing more than a violation, violation. of your moral Amen. obligations. Amen, brother. There you go. So it's not that God has a moral government that is disputed, but what are the principles and policies of the divine administration that is disputed. So right. God has a government that promotes our well-being. If everyone lived the way God wanted us to live, we'd have universal happiness. But sinners are not mindful of others as they ought to be, and they're not mindful of God as they ought to be. God is in none of their thoughts. Mm -hmm. They think only for themselves. I remember when I was a sinner, and I, I was a drug dealer. And I uh, started at a young age. I started selling drugs at uh, 14, maybe 13. And uh, I remember walking through the Catholic church, the, the churchyard. And, you know, I'm smoking cigarettes and I'm smuggling drugs. And I had, uh, I had a, a QP in my, of marijuana in my hoodie. And I'm smoking cigarettes, and smoking cigarettes makes you want to spit, you know, saliva. But I thought it would be disrespectful for me to spit walking through this church. Wow. So I was like, you know what, I'm not going to spit. And when I die, and I go and stand before God, He's going to remember that I did not spit. You've been smoking Of course, while I'm smoking cigarettes, smuggling drugs through town. <laughs> And I'm thinking, I'm not going to spit. How about that? Wow. So even when I was, quote unquote, mindful of God, right. I was not truly mindful of God as I ought to be. Right. I was still just being mindful of myself. Yeah. Oh, I knew God was watching me, and oh, I didn't want to get on his bad side, because not that I care about him, but that I cared about me. Yeah. When I became a Christian, it became different. I have great sympathy for God. You know, I was one time going through uh, the Ten Commandments. I stood up to preach uh, to a crowd of sinners there in, in the inner city, going through the Ten Commandments. And I got through the first commandment, I'm the Lord your God, and shall have no other gods before me. 
And I just broke down. I started to weep. And, uh, you know, people talk about Whitfield, you know, going out and just weeping and weeping mm -hmm. for sinners. But I wasn't weeping for sinners. I wasn't weeping for them at all. I was weeping for God. I was thinking about how often and how frequently that commandment is broken. I am right. the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before Amen. me. That's right. People put anything before God. Yeah. Yeah. They, put their, they treat their dog better than they treat God. Yes. Yeah. Yes. They give more attention to their household pets yes. than they give to God. Yes. Yes. God is the most mistreated being in the entire universe. Yes. Yes. Nobody yes. has been sinned against more than God. No one right. has been mistreated more than God. Right. And if we're going to have sympathy for sinners, how much more should we have sympathy for God? That's right. That's good. You know, the theologians portray this idea of God, and it's really a Greek you know, portrayal of the infinite, impassable. Right. You know, he, he, unchangeable. You know, and, and you get this idea of an impersonal God. Who doesn't really have feelings, doesn't really get hurt. The God of the Bible is grieved. The God of the Bible is angered. He has feelings. And it's not mere anthropomorphic. Right. Right. You know, an anthropomorphic uh, description, it's actually not an anthropomorphic, it'd be an uh, anthropopathic uh, portrayal of God. Anthropopathic or anthropomorphic portrayal of God is trying to communicate something to us. And when you know, you know, we're talking about uh, you know, God, you know, and being under the shadow of His wings. Right. God doesn't have wings. Right. It means you're under His protection. That's right. But when God, when the Bible portrays God is broken-hearted, yes. that's trying to portray that God is broken-hearted. Right. He is a being. We were made in His image. The only reason we feel grief and pain is because He does. Yes. I was complaining to God, you know, it's bad enough that I, I'm an open-air preacher. That's controversial in the church. And I'm not just an open-air preacher. I'm a shock and awe confrontational preacher. That's even worse. Right. And I'm not just a shock and awe open-air preacher. You know, I have a very controversial theology. And so it's like... I'm complaining to God. It's not like I choose to be this way. I mean, I feel like God made me this way. He taught me things. <laughs> and I'm like, so I'm just like complaining to God. I'm like, God, you know, I just feel so rejected. I just feel so rejected. I mean, I want friends. I want to fit in with people. I don't want to be an outcast. And I just feel so rejected. So, I mean, obviously I'm looking for comfort from God. You know what God, I felt like God said to me? I said, me too. Yeah. Oh, oh, right. uh, oh, oh, wow. Come on. Here, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get sympathy from God. Mm -hmm. I ought to have sympathy for God. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. interesting. And I'm like, man, he's no comfort. <laughs> that didn't comfort me at all. <laughs> no. And I realized God is more rejected than I am. God's more hated than I am. And the only reason I'm hated by the world it's because God in me. When I was me, without Christ in me, when I was just me ruling my own life, man, the world loved me. That's right. Oh, man, I had friends. People wanted to hang out with me. People said, oh, Jesse's a cool guy. Everyone wanted to come to my house to party. My, my house was the place to be. Man, I got along with the world when it was me. Sure. When it was Christ in me, oh, now I'm under the hatred of the world. Yeah. And so it is. I have sympathy for God, he, and what we do affects Him. We, we have been given a great ability that how we live can either please Him or grieve Him. Right. And with great ability comes great responsibility. We would have no obligation towards God if we could not affect Him at all. Right. You know, when we're commanded to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and what is love? It's not a mere feeling, oh, I love God, it's a feeling. No, to love Him is a committal of your will to promote His well-being. Right. And the essence of well-being is this mental satisfaction of happiness. You know, and that comes not through sin, but through righteousness and holiness, living towards each other as we ought to. Well, if we're obligated towards God, that means we can actually affect Him. That we, we can actually interfere with His happiness. Right. The Bible portrays God as grieved over sin. That's a violation of his happiness. Right. 
the Bible says God is provoked to anger by sin. That's, right. That's a inter interfering with his happiness. That's right, right. Provoked. God has never sinned. He deserves perfect happiness. But he's not happy all the time. Right. Good. He's grieved and angered. His happiness is interfered with, interrupted, violated. And so it is that we ought to be sympathetic towards God. And the sinner is not. He's in his unregenerate mind, thinks supremely of himself, and God is in none of his thoughts. Mm -hmm. So here, what's the answer? The sinner is carnally minded. What does a sinner need to do? He needs to repent. Right. Him. And remember what repentance is? It's a change of mind. You know, to have a change of mind is not mere a change of beliefs. If I say, I'm, I'm going to come to soap. Wait, never mind. I change my mind. Right. That means I'm not going to come. Or if I say, uh, you know, I don't like you guys. Never mind, I changed my mind. You know, I, I'm, I'm changing the way I'm going to act towards you. How I'm going to behave towards you. Right. You know, a change of mind results in a change of life. Right. A change of direction. Amen. And repenting of your sin is a change of mind about sinning. Right. Amen. And so the sinner, being carnally minded, needs to change his mind. And as you already heard, it's not a work. It's, a, it's merely a change of mind brought about by the influence of God. Man does not repent independent of God because right. he is utterly unwilling right. to, to live for God and to right. serve God. And if it wasn't for God interfering and interrupting with our carnality and our selfish pursuit of our own gratification, if God didn't interrupt it, God didn't intervene and interfere, we never would have repented. Amen. Because of because of, he came through. So it's choice done under influence. To repent is a choice of the mind. Done under the influence of God. So when you sin, you have no one to blame but yourself. Amen. You did it. It's your fault. You had created by God the power of contrary choice. You didn't have to do it. You have no excuse. You sinned. It's your fault. It's not God's. Right. You repent. It's God who gets the glory. Because if God had not intervened and interfered, you would have kept on in your life of sin. Right? Amen. Amen. You get the blame for your sin, God gets the glory for your repentance, even though it is your choice. Praise so a God. sinner needs to repent, and this is why. Number one, to cease his enmity. You cannot be the friend of God while you remain his enemy. Right. You cannot be reconciled to God while you continue your warfare against him. Right. And every sinner is at war with God. Right. They don't want his ways. I remember as a sinner, I hated the goody goodies. The goody two shoes. Yeah. Hated them. Yeah. Probably because, I mean, it brought conviction to my heart. Right. Yeah. 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 And if you hate what is good, you hate God. Amen. I never would have said I hated God. I would have flattered myself. Oh, I love God. Sure. Sure. But the way I lived was hostile towards him. You need to repent. To cease your enmity with God. The sinner in his fallen condition, in his unregenerate state, is the enemy of God, and to repent is to cease his enmity. Number two, he needs to repent in order to be forgiven. You know, the idea that God gives unconditional forgiveness is absolute nonsense. It's the yeah. fantasy of a sinner. Right. Right. Amen. That's all it is. It's the fantasy of a sinner. Amen. I tell the sinners out on campus, here's the story, you know, of uh, Robert the Rapist. And Robert the Rapist is uh, going around raping people and raping people, but he knows it's wrong, and he prays, God, please forgive me. But he keeps doing it, and he keeps doing it. So when he prays, God, forgive me, what does God say? No! Amen. <laughs> if God were to answer. If anything, maybe God just plugs his ears and turns right. his back. Doesn't even listen. <laughs> we'll not hear it. We'll not hear it. We'll not hear it. That's we'll biblical. Not hear it. Oh, yeah. That's right. All the students freak out yeah. at the idea of God not listening mm. or saying no to a prayer like that. Mm. Because they fantasize in their wickedness that God is altogether like them. Yeah. They don't think sin's a big deal. Therefore, they don't think God thinks it's a big deal. Right. They make God into their image. Mm. And they fantasize of an unconditional forgiveness. What if the president gave every criminal in prison a pardon? Wow. Every child molester, every rapist, every murderer, let them all go. 
That would be contrary to the welfare of the community. It would be unreasonable. It would be unloving. A ruler who did that would be lacking something in his head or lacking something in his heart or both. And yet, they know that would be unreasonable. The sinners, when I tell them out on campus, what if every, what if Obama gave a pardon to every criminal? Well, they wouldn't do that. That's stupid. That's unreasonable. Yeah. Oh, so th that would be stupid for our civil government, and yet you think that's love in God's moral government. Right. You think God is going to do something that's stupid by your own confession. That would be stupid. And yet you think God's going to do that. No, no, no. If God were to give an unconditional forgiveness, it would be contrary to the well-being of his community. So God, out of love, requires repentance in order to be forgiven. Uh, to ask God to forgive you for a sin that you fully plan on continuing in is to ask God for a license to sin. It's to ask God to turn his attribute of mercy into that which is contrary to the well-being of his people. Right. So that mercy no longer becomes an act of love. Mercy becomes an act of foolishness and wickedness. Right. Right. It's an insult to God That's right. to even ask Him for a license to sin. An absolute insult to God. Yes. And of course, as we already mentioned, you must repent to be fit for heaven. A sinner is unfit for heaven. He would ruin the place. One sinner... Does right. much harm. Yeah. And so the sinner must repent in order to be fit for heaven. He doesn't merit heaven. He doesn't earn heaven. It's unmerited, but it's not unconditional. Right. It's unearned. Nevertheless, the Bible says you need to be fit for it. That comes through repentance, the start of a holy life. So the man's fallen condition, his unregenerate state, his enmity with God, a voluntary depravity of his mind. He chooses to be carnally minded. When it says the carnal mind is enmity with God, not subjected to the law of God, neither indeed can be. It's not saying that the sinner cannot be. It's not saying that the sinner cannot repent. It's simply saying that the carnal mind, that mindset, is and cannot be obedience to God's law. No matter how you slice it, right. anything done out of selfishness is not obedience to God's law. But can the sinner who made the carnal mind or chose the carnal with his mind, is he capable of changing his mind? Absolutely. All throughout the Bible, God calls men to repent, and if they do not do it, he blames them for it. Right. And at times he's astonished at their, at their impenitence. He marvels at their unbelief. Right. He upbraids them and rebukes them for their impenitence, showing that it's not his fault that they didn't repent, it's their fault that they didn't repent. Yeah. Wow. So that's, the un, that's the state of the unregenerate, the fallen condition of man. Hmm. Being regenerated is not a change of your constitution, it's a change of your character.